Guys, welcome to another episode of Breaking Down. Get in there. That videos. is not a handshake in America. This right. is uh, a video that I take at uh, the University of Kentucky. On campus itself, actually, I had a friend who was a professor who helped me set up in the school itself. So highly recommended that you do that. Okay. Saves you from getting, you know, harassed by campus security multiple, multiple times. Got to get those inside friends. <laughs> anyway, uh, I set up my table and I've got... Uh, um, greeted by this guy who wants okay. to chat. Um, Would you mind if it seemed a little uh, guarded at first? It? It's, it's, yeah. I okay, mean, well, cool. What purposes are you using it for? I'm trying to show that there's value to a face to face communication compared to like texting over the phone or like over over what medium? Facebook Messenger okay, and stuff sure. like that. That there's value in face to face. I respect that. That there's ways okay. to have conversations about anything with anyone, regardless of what they look like, the beliefs, yeah. backgrounds, what are whatever. You doctoring? Uh, biochemistry. Cool. Yeah. And so I go to parks and I go to campuses and I just set up a table. I think it's a really nice contrast between what that guy's that's, doing over there see, that's right, exa exactly and what's why. going on that was, here. That's what, what was, what was my, on my mind here was... And I'm not a part of any religious how effective organization. Is it? Yeah. I'm literally just trying to have a conversation with someone in a cordial way. How effective do you think... Cordial, that, let's go. Obviously, you've got, a, you've got a pretty solid opinion on this, but how effective do you think it is for them to be... For, for their method of, of information... Let's let's make sure we're coloring the complete canvas on what's actually going on here. So I'm set up in front of a building called Whitehall. And just behind me, there's like one of those Westboro Baptist, you know, kind of guys with a giant sign and telling everyone they're going to hell. And he's masked a rather large collection of people around him. It's kind of like your classic YouTube situation where silly dude does something thousands and thousands and thousands of people around him <laughs> and then sensible dude we right here you know well dressed got his glasses on having a normal talk hey maybe you know hey it may not get the views but i think to me is more of a demonstration that anybody can do this because you don't need to have the crowd anybody can have a conversation about anything with anyone uh, particularly on a one-on-one -on -one, and it only takes one person and a willingness to try it out to make it work and that's what I think is kind of cool about it so yeah there's a street preacher behind us going crazy and I set up near him hopefully out of earshot not really so much but I try to get it far away enough from that his you know screaming wouldn't get involved in the video and I was just talking to some of the stragglers that are around him or people who are coming in and out of the building talk to this guy um, I believe he was an atheist but um, I think it was a little guarded at first because just like I I don't want to be <laughs> I don't want to be recorded. <laughs> Why are you recording me? <laughs> so I'm just like, hey man, this is this is literally just a thing to talk about. Whatever you're comfortable talking about in front of the camera, and I'm just trying to show people can have that face to face conversation because if we can't demonstrate that, and the only example we have is that guy behind us, where are we left with? It's worth to make this effort. How about it? You want to chat? And I think we had a good one. Let's see. Persuasion, which is primarily yelling, primarily accusational. I think some people buy into the confidence, to be perfectly honest with you, yeah. but it's not very much. But it's so cheap for them to do that that it's worth it. Boom. Mitchell. It's so cheap to just be Yo. silly and loud and I'm have people listen to you. I'm having a five-minute chat. <laughs> I, I, was, I was studying for my PCAM exam for a couple hours, and then I went back to that for a few minutes. Yeah. This seems like a real thing. But do you want to try it? Yeah, Out? sure. Okay. Okay, cool. so now he's in. And you don't mind... Just to chat about anything. And you don't mind for a record, right? That's fine. Well. Okay, so... Cool. Hi, I'm he's, Ty. He's a little Eric, bit more sold into it. Eric, again? Let Eric. me tell you something. Um, the handshake at the start is really good. And I think I started doing this only a couple of months into it. But you gotta shake hands at the start. When people are, like, so... Like, crossing their hands, crossing their arms at the beginning of a chat. When you reach over and you're just like, Hey, man, I'm not gonna bite you. And you get the handshake in, I think... It just loosens everybody up a little bit more. It's just really good. Eric, Eric's that so contact, you know? Since the thing with that guy is over there, would you mind if we had a chat about something sure. that you strongly believe is true or something you know um, you can't be wrong about? Oh, yeah, there's like, nothing I know I can't be wrong about. Ooh, Ooh I love that. We could, we, could, we could have a discussion about that in itself. Is there, is there anything, what's the most thing that you're absolutely sure about? What's closest to that? So note how I'm pivoting here. He said, and, and I'll explain why I pivot. So the pivot is, Guy says, uh, there's, I, generally, I'm not 100% confident about anything. Do you want to talk about that? Confident about anything. Do you want to talk about that? 
do you want to turn that into a topic? And I'm like, ah, I don't want to talk about that because that's not an interesting conversation. I've had it before. It's, it's a sort of conversation where, um, for example, I think the last guy I had this conversation with was a guy who was from South Africa. Like I've, I've seen the routes of that conversation. It tends to be the, ca- it tends to be the case that the people who claim that there's nothing that they're 100% confident about tend to have something that they are 100% confident about. It just turns out not to be a religious thing. It could just be a personal philosophy or a motivation or just a weird little, you know, thing that they have that's not particularly important as far as like the, the creation of the universe, but more like a mundane thing that they think they should you should always do. Like, hey man, you should always have peanut butter in your trunk when you're driving from California to Nevada. So it's like, what? Really? Like, is that what you want to believe? Let, that's a much more interesting conversation. Let's have that. Let's let's talk about that. So I'm pivoting here, the pivot. And remember, I only pivot at the very beginning of conversations, not typically like halfway or a third into the conversation. But the pivot here is, okay, so you're not 100% confident about anything. Why don't you tell me the thing that you're most confident in? And we'll talk about that. And that is... It's kind of close to the idea of like, I get that you're not 100% confident or that you're not absolute about anything. Like you have a reasonable amount of skepticism for most things, which is healthy. I think that's good. But in the interest of having an entertaining conversation with me, a complete stranger, why don't we talk about something that you are really interested in or mostly confident in? And like, what's the thing that you do believe? Not the stance of you don't believe anything, to a high degree, but what's something that is substantial and substantive for a conversation that you do believe in? And that's the pivot. I think at the very beginning of a conversation, it's a good way to, uh, it's a good idea to try to get that trajectory towards interesting talk. I, I, you'll get to meteor levels faster. I think it's just a good way to do it. Let's go. Absolute sure. Um I think the thing that I would be closest to being absolutely sure, which is what supports my belief of nothing being above suspicion or above argument, above discussion, um, would be that belief in itself, which is um, I'm absolutely sure that the most effective way that I can um, build up my belief system to be the best that it can be, Mm -hmm. obviously that's subjective, is to allow it to be open to any reasonable criticism or argument and to always be questioning it. Are you even 100% about that? 100% yeah, confident? I think so. You're 100% confident about that? Or as close as I can get. Okay, okay. that's okay. a good correction. It would I mean, be because, ironic because ultimately, that that- typically that, so that, so me just repeating that question is the confidence scale. By the way, there's something called a confidence scale. Confidence scale is sort of like, hey, on a scale from one to 100, or zero to 100. I hate scales from one to 100 because you forgot about zero. You need to have zero in there. Uh, what is, how sure are you on a scale from zero to 100 that this thing's true? Typically, people who say zero or 100% are exhibiting the concept of irrational confidence. There's something called like the, I forgot what it's called, the Dunger Kruger scale. It's people tend to be at their lowest or highest confidence when they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> It's like, yeah, I know karate. <laughs> Push in the face. Actually, maybe there's some things I should learn about. Get their 14th black belt. It's like, actually, there's a whole world of karate that I don't even know about. Like, there's a there's a curve that goes from, like, y- you really, like, there's your confidence. Like, you just started off and you're so confident that you know everything. And then it just levels out. And then you maybe get some bumps, but it never gets to an absolute zero or 100%. It tends to be the case that people are 100% really don't know what they're talking about. So all I'm doing here is verifying that he's 100% confident in that belief that he has. It sounds reasonable, but is he so confident that he's not even considering the idea that he could be wrong, which is that 100% level. And instead of me throwing out numbers, which are kind of arbitrary and a little bit complex to like bring in, like to stop the conversation and introduce a scale and explain what the lower and higher limits of that scale are, all I'm doing is just repeating the question. So it's like, I'm saying, hey, you're 100% confident that's true. I'm, as hun- I'm 100%. Are you really 100%? Actually, I'm as close to 100 as you can get. <laughs> it's subtle. It's very subtle. But it's just highlighting that, like, hey, I'm making sure. Are you absolute about this? I'm absolutely absolute. Are you really absolute? Actually, I'm not that absolute, but I'm 
very, very sure that it's the case. I'm just opening up the door to show that I do care about the nuance of how confident and how certain he is about this belief. I'm willing to hear him out if he has more to say, and it doesn't need to be a short conversation where it's just like, how confident are you? Okay, that's great. It's like, no, I really do care. Are you confident about this or not? Like, and to what extent? And that's why it's worth asking the question again. It gives me an assessment or a scale of how confident he actually is. And it doesn't sound like he's absolute to the point where he's closed-minded. It just, it just sounds like he's very certain that it's the case and um, is willing to question whether or not he's wrong. And I think that's fantastic. So here we go. Ultimately, yeah, ultimately, <laughs> if somebody, ultimately, if somebody, you know, if I, if I converted to some religion and I sure. was 100% confident in that, then it would be, you know impossible for me there are some people who are very confident about like for example what god existing yeah what is the confidence detriment? doesn't bother me it's just when people are so confident in their beliefs that they're unwilling to question it like yeah. unwilling to put to put logic or reason against it i agree i would call that the 100 percent level i didn't start the or the zero percent so level it's fine. and you can get up anytime you want it's good okay. in that opinion that's that's when it becomes a danger to a potential danger to society and other people okay why is it a danger? Is it, and I'm going to throw something out here, is it because their actions are informed by their beliefs? So if they have closed minded no, beliefs? Okay, why? Interesting. Um, Where's the danger? So again, I, I'm agreeing with what he's saying, but I'm trying now, what I'm trying to do right now is throw out the reasons why I'm agreeing with him and then seeing if that's reliable or if that's a reasonable reason for why I believe the things that I believe because it seems like we're agreeing on the same topic. So I'm throwing out my route of reasoning of how I re reach that topic. Hey, people are motivated by the things that they believe. People don't just believe in a vacuum. Their actions are informed by their beliefs. And if their beliefs are factored on something that's unquestioning and closed-minded because they're so sure, that could lead to actions that are problematic in a society where, we're, where actions have consequences on other people. And I find that to be the danger to society. He says, no, that's not the case. And now I'm willing to open up my you know, perspective and learn from him. This is now, again, it, I think it goes back to the video that we did with uh, Maria. It's not just, SE is not just a one-way street. I'm trying to learn as much from my interview partner as I, I can hopefully get out of a conversation. SE in its own right isn't really a teaching method. I think I said like, I'm not trying to explain to someone why they're wrong. I'm trying to understand why they're right. And I think that's the crux of what makes SE a really great conversational tool because I'm, I'm not telling or teaching this guy anything. I'm trying to learn from him. And he, in the same right, is reflecting that same attitude and is learning from me. And it ends up being this conversation where we're both talking about this thing that we strongly believe but are willing to take a, uh, uh, a reliable or a reflective way of understanding why we care about this thing and we can do it uh, cumulatively and I think that's just a really cool thing about SE anyway here we go danger the danger is because when you are so certain of any belief um, I mean religious or otherwise literally any belief um, that you <laughs> would not question it <laughs> let me tell you something I went to Walmart and I got this sippy cup right and the cool thing about the sippy cup is it's got a lock on it and a spout which was like the only thing I really needed because I used to do a lot of running back in, in, in when I was in Kentucky and I would have a water bottle on me, but it would either a smell like plastic, but make the water smell like plastic after like a day or have one of those um, um, spouts where you have to like squeeze the bottle to push the water into your mouth. And I'm like, dude, I just want to be able to drink water, not have it like forced down my throat. <laughs> I just want to be able to drink water, like drink, like gluck. That's it. And I'm like, oh, it's got everywhere. So I found these really small sippy cups. They're really, they're colored in an interesting way. And I was just like, these are, these are really great. They look like little kid, four year old sippy cups, but they functionally work. And in my opinion, if it looks silly and it does its job, it's not silly. So uh, I can still laugh at it, but a, I can tell you these these were a fantastic buy. Anyway. For any reason, then there are, and holy books do a, you know, are have an outsized effect in this. There are plenty of of violent and um, violent phrases and verses and every holy book that I've read thus far, mm -hmm. which advocate all sorts of terrible things against people. And so if you're not willing to question your beliefs for anything, mm -hmm. 
then you might come across that verse and say, if I truly want to be to want to want to follow my beliefs that I honestly believe, I feel I'm like we're saying the same mm-hmm. thing. That yeah. question. Mm-hmm. The only way for me to do that is to hurt somebody else. Mm. So that's why it becomes dangerous. Eric, can I throw something out at you? Sure. If I were to present to you a holy book from a religion, and ah, I'd- here we go. All right. So I say. So just to recap, I'm saying that the actions. People don't believe in a vacuum. Their actions are informed by their beliefs. And that's why I think it could lead to harm to society if people are performing actions against one another or or we live in a world where our actions have consequences in other people and we're not willing to be open-minded about that. And and we are, we are performing our interactions and, and conduct based on an absolutist belief that is unwilling to question, change, or modify itself for the better. And Eric's point of view was the same thing, but more focused on the concept of, well, you know, there are religious books that tell you to do bad things. And if people don't willing to question that, then people will do bad things. And what I'm trying to do is remove the nuance of just having, remove that narrow sightedness of just, it's not just the holy book that's the problem. Because there could be good holy books that tell you, hey, go love your neighbor. If there was only if there was only if there was a holy book that only said love people would and you believe that to 100 percent certainty, would that be any more rational way to conduct your life? Or should we at least just be willing to read anything we want with an open mind and then inform our beliefs based on that? So, like, the, the idea is. And I know I'm getting a little, I hope this, I hope this explanation get really, really short, but like, I'm trying to get to the general foundation of the argument, which is you don't be absolutist in your beliefs. Try to be open-minded because those open-minded beliefs will lead to open-minded actions. And in the society where our, con- where our actions have consequences on each other, that is leading t- that will lead us towards an evolution of behavior that will ultimately lead to improvement of everyone's lives because we can change and, and modify how we conduct ourselves for the better end of everybody. And it's not, and, and Eric's point is, well, I'll look at the bad situation where there's a holy book that can tell you to do bad things, but I'm like, it's not just the holy book that's telling you to do bad things because if it was a holy book that only told you to do good things and you believe that absolutely, that could lead you to just as many problems that absolute if there was a book that says hey always love the person who's three feet to your right and you believe that absolutely and that three person that three foot person the person three foot to the right of you is like a psychopath or a serial killer or just a terrible girlfriend (laughs) hey give me i won't do impressions no she is like give me your credit card number (laughs) and i'm like dude i don't want to give you my credit card number but the holy book says you should love her it's like this will lead to problems in the future we need to sit down and have conversations about finances it's not just about romance you gotta you have to communicate like they won't tell you stuff like that we got off on a little bit of a tangent here but like i'm saying like hey you gotta think thinking was what's important not just absolute loyalty to a holy book whether it says bad things or good things it's about thinking it's about being open-minded and that's the concept now that i am challenging i'm not teaching i'm just challenging it so i'm not telling them hey you're wrong and this is why you're wrong i'm i'm now throwing out an idea of like well what if there was a holy book that only said good things would you then follow that absolutely i normally always ask very gentle I'm not offended by seeing the holy book but if i if i read any holy book that had zero violence in it whatsoever it was all about peace and love and how our god wants you to have peace and love blah 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 would that confirm to you that the book's true that there is no violence in that book i say true here but i think as i think in the conversation not be- okay i think in the conversation that's the point but in my head i'm interpreting this conversation differently so so here's the here's the here's the extrapolation that I'm making. Um, if the book is tr- is nonviolent, so he's saying books that are nonviolent, or books that are violent don't deserve our absolute uh, uh, confidence in whether or not they're true or not, or whether or not they should be used as a guide for behavior. And I'm throwing out, okay, so what if we had a book that only had positive, nonviolent, you know, things? Would that make that book true? true in the sense of it's worth believing in full heartedly 
worth an absolute degree of certainty and confidence for and should be used to guide all of our um, actions and actually be the case for how reality was you know uh, presented or created for us it, whatever take your pick and Being so now we're thinking more true let me just replay that no, it's not good. as What's the nature of the book have to do with Does something not being violent make it more true? Yeah, does something, so something being not violent make it more true? Obviously not. So it's not so much about whether or not the holy book says bad things or good things. It's more about something else. If that's if if he comes to that realization. No, I mean there's there's plenty of violent things that are true. So what's more what's your limiter for? That's true. What's your limiter for determining if something's true compared to if something's not true? There is no perfect metric. Mm. It's that's that's why I always go back to that rule or belief or whatever of of questioning it. Right? I like it because you know. I mean, I if there was a book that was truly that great, um, then I, I I could say. I would say I could I could believe in it to the point of belief, sure. Um, but it wouldn't really be belief mm. because it would be verified and always under always never never above question. I'm going to throw out some of the things that I heard since I started setting up here. Um, I heard that there were some people who believe that it's true using faith. Does faith have any value to you as far as a determining mechanism of something's true or not true? Um, not really. And why or why not? Because I, I see faith as contrary to to verify to to, to, to verifying something. Mm. Um, and that's not to say that How I do you, don't. What do you mean by that? To to have faith in something means that you trust without verification, right? Most likely, yeah. I think um, it's a reasonable definition. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Although I certainly have confidence, and see, faith could be a re faith would be a reasonable word. Like I have faith in my parent in the in the consistency of my parents to look out for what's best for me as they see mm. fit. Right? Yeah. I may disagree with them, but I still I still trust. And see, that's where I think faith is a little bit of a testy word because it has so many negative logical connotations to me mm -hmm. that I resist using it. Mm. Um, although if it was defined in a context where you just it just means you're putting your belief in someone past which you can immediately verify i get it so i don't know every i completely forgot about this conversation but that's that is a in my opinion a nice way of defining faith it's like i am i am believing past my ability to verify that this is true is that a reliable way to determine if something's true or not no obviously but is it typically what people mean when they say faith yes and I think if people understood it like that, that would be so good. That's a really good way. Let me write that down. Faith, I'm just making a point. Faith is trusting or putting your belief beyond what you can verify. Putting your belief, whoop, your belief beyond what you can verify. And this is really good, you know, study for me as well. But yeah, I think that's really good. I think that's a very um, on the point way of defining faith, uh, especially on the way how so many other people use it. Everything that goes on my on my parents' minds, but right. I still faith or tr f have faith or trust that they're have have my best. But he's not choice. using faith to Can verify what's true. Go so on. then, what is he using? Are you to currently what's convinced true? of any God claim? No. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's good enough evidence for it. Is an atheist a good way of defining what your position is at right now? Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm one too. It's not a big deal. Um, are you scared of hell? <laughs> <laughs> Why did I throw that out? No, sorry, I mean, sorry. when you... Sorry. I'm, that was a I'm, bit of a tangent. Term. And, and another, just, you know, side, side point. Sure. Um, but so I would say I, I've never been... Not never. That's not true. I used to be religious, okay. quite religious, and my journey towards being atheist actually was in a pursuit of... Yeah, exactly. Religion, no, dude, that's the exact same path right now. Yeah. Yeah. A um, lot of atheists become... But I would say 
or I'm not afraid that's of how dying. a lot of people I'm just become afraid atheists. Of not living because ultimately, mm. as an atheist, I don't believe there's anything after death because True. I don't see good enough evidence for it. That's to say that I know it won't happen. Anything will happen. Yeah. but I don't have any good reason. To exactly. That's exactly. True. Because so well if somebody presents the evidence for God, that I would, I would absolutely be. I would, I would change my belief right then. But or I may else not be worship it. But I may not worship that God. But fair, I'll definitely fair. at least be open that. Yeah, that God's true. Because I mean, there's there's certain very difficult. I mean, impossible things to reconcile in my mind, which is, if, if there's an all-powerful God, which is, how could an all-powerful God so, allow childhood cancer? And if, and if he does... Yeah, sure, the problem of evil, Is right? he really worthy of worship? Right. Like, you know, my big thing is... There's a lot is, of issues there. As an atheist talking to another atheist, I find that a lot of people use substandard methods to come to the high confidence that their God exists. Mm -hmm. But ultimately their faith isn't justified because they have unreliable methods of supporting all that faith and stuff. I'm wondering, I noticed that before we were talking, there was some apprehension, especially with regard to like recording. Oh, this what is was interesting. That based um, I guess at this it's point, based in a, I, would say I a might have been like, kind of. I've um, talked, okay. not that I we've talked, we got, we got to some interesting nuggets. Now I want to understand from more, I guess, like from a gives you some tactical standpoint, what, totally what can I do understand. to make my stand so seem more approachable to people who, you know, might be atheists, people might be religious. Or even that I said something that was unreasonable and then maybe I changed my mind after, exactly. afterwards. That seems to be the case. Right people just don't like being recorded. Actually, I didn't really like that interview we did. We might have taken off the internet. I'd be totally open to doing that. I could even blur your face or whatever. I'm fine with this being on the internet. Yeah. It doesn't. Um, but I, I just... I am really interested in how this table looks like to yeah. many different kinds of people. Yeah. yeah. It surprisingly attracts a lot of different kinds of people, and I try to make it as least assuming as possible. I would say why it was attractive to me, not that that was necessarily a question, but <laughs> <laughs> talking in general, so, um, was because I, I find their rantings, as I would call it, um, amusing. Sure. But I don't really... I don't really appreciate when people rise to the bait and yell because some people do, some people really are, you know, their barriers are low enough or weak enough that they really can get past and, and emotionally hurt someone just by yelling at them, right? Sure. And so that's Absolutely when, I, that's that's when it, it kind of bothers me because some people will yell back, back at them and it, my, my view of arguments is if you start yelling, you've already lost the argument. And so their entire purpose to me, as, as in like, how how they wish to convert people is to yeah. is just it's just loud and not necessarily through logical consistency. Sure. And so if you rise to the bait, then right. you've already kind of lost because yes. you're not, not calmly that, thinking about it. From but that yelling platform is a territory they're much more comfortable in. That's fair. And right. even though it appears that they're ranting, they are very much more now guided by intuition because they're so comfortable in that environment. Whereas the other one's more or less guided by emotion, which I makes largely agree persuasion by rhetoric much more easy to do and it's it's in, it's interesting and oh man we're ironic and we're really breaking down this guy that on a college campus well people would people would be so enticed to that i understand what you mean but this is a free speech area i think i'm I, we're all exercising our right right to i just mean to it. because as a as a place of higher learning our, our goal is to put behind our Irrational ways, whatever they be, not necessarily belief. No, I understand. Um, but just put, put behind irrational beliefs and, and rise to some something more logical and less something, decisive. At yeah, le, yeah, and something that can further. The, well, as an engineer, a lot of some things are decisive, but uh, engineer but, uh, too. Can yeah. I'm an engineer. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Okay, hey, yeah. look at you, nice, engineer. nice. Um, but ri rise to something that's you know a greater, and I realize that's subjective, but mm. something that's not as privy or as likely. To just to have these random yelling arguments about sure you know yeah hey Eric so, I enjoyed the chat I did as well you got to study <laughs> I, I for people really you get through <laughs> don't let me distract you I was already doing it I yeah. guess that's life is life hey. this, this calmed me down far more than last <laughs> oh that's nice so, hey cool. I will say this cool. uh, know right. when so, uh, to when end here. the yeah. conversation uh, yeah. like sometimes when you so run out of things to talk about it's totally fine to just be like hey I really enjoyed this chat thanks a lot see you around man I think I think they ended in a good place. I what like the um, I like the post interview summary of like, hey, what can we do, do to make this table look better? And then here's another guy who's screaming at people right behind us. What what makes that so captivating versus advantages of doing that and advantages of doing it like this? And is there actually things that you can get out of that? I think that was a really interesting you know way to close the talk. Thank you. Anyway, uh, yeah. That was cool.
that was cool. Okay, so yeah, uh, speaking of knowing when to end the conversation, we'll end this study session uh, now. Thank you guys for joining me, and see you next time.